Hey, let's give it up for the worship team. Thank you guys for... I was telling them earlier that um, all the songs they sang were like all of my favorite songs, and I was like, man, like I... Uh, and then I also realized that they're also like the, all of the most convicting songs like in the world. <laughs> like, uh, Jesus is my treasure. I just think about that song and what it's calling us to, to... Um, give up everything that we might hold on to and rather to follow Jesus. And, um, and even that last song, I mean, Christ be magnified. I mean, like, do, do you have, do you guys, have you guys ever realized that songs are just prayers put to melodies? Have you guys ever realized that before? Uh, and even that, that, that chorus, oh, Christ be magnified that, you know, in me, that my life would be, you know, like it would be an altar. Um, it's this image of us actually like asking God as much as we're praising God for who he is. It's as, it's as much as us asking him, God, would you, in all that you do, would you be magnified in me? Would you work in me that I might actually be able to magnify you? It's just a cool thing to, to bring to memory. Hey, let's pray for a moment here and pray for uh, our worship team as they go and lead uh, in middle school. Uh, they've got two days for the rest of the summer where they're leading in here and they go lead in middle school. Let's go pray for them that God would be uh, we just supply them with everything they need, as well as let's pray for ourselves here as we jump into the sermon today, um, that God would open up our, uh, our hearts, he would soften our hearts to hear what he has to say, as well as open up our ears and our minds to, to comprehend and wrap our minds around what he has to say through his word today. So like I always say, don't let me pray at you, let's pray together, pray with me, uh, and then we'll get our service started here. So let's just bow our heads in prayer for a moment. Father in heaven, we give you thanks. Father, you have been so good and so kind to us. Father, even as we woke up this morning with the sun shining, it's just another um, reminder of your reoccurring goodness and kindness to us, Father, that you bring about a new day every single day. Father, in the same way, you bring about new grace and new mercy afresh every single morning. And Father, we... Whether we know it or not, we desperately need that grace and that mercy. And so, Father, I pray that, Father, that we would receive that grace and that mercy, especially now, that it would soften our hearts, that regardless of how we've walked into this room today, whether it's at the end of finally a long school year, a long week of finals, or maybe even just the first week or two of summer, Father, that you would soften our hearts to hear what you have to say from your word, that we might learn from you and be spurred on to greater faithfulness to you. Father, would you uh, be with and supply our worship team with everything they need for, uh, for, for life and for godliness, especially in these next couple of minutes as they can go and lead worship for our younger brothers and sisters in Christ in the middle school. Father, would you too be magnified in that place and worshiped and glorified for who you truly are and how good and how faithful you are. So Father, we give you thanks for these things. We pray all of them in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. I remember when uh, I got saved. It was, it was about middle of my sophomore year. Uh, of It was after the sophomore year when I was in high school. I went to a summer camp, like, like similar to the summer camp that we're about to go uh, into in about uh, 10 or so days. And I remember uh, for the very first time, I, 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 I probably like many of you, I was raised in church. My mom very faithfully brought me to church uh, all the, pretty much every single Sunday when I was growing up. And then it finally all kind of clicked for me. I've told a bit of this story to you guys before where I kind of began to see who God was. I saw his worthiness to be praised and his glory and his beauty, but then also I saw what his son Jesus had done and that all of the imperfections and the failures that I had were not something that were an obstacle for him, but they actually became the very thing that he would then use to draw me to himself that I might find freedom and grace in that. And I remember walking out of that summer camp being transformed in my heart. Something had changed in me because I had experienced the grace of Christ. But what I also realized when I walked out of that summer camp and into the rest of what would be my junior year, my senior year of high school, as I look back, one of the things that was greatly lacking in my life was one, biblical community, and two, discipleship, and especially then third, probably time in the Word. And I remember for, for, for that, those two years, I kind of existed on, on like a very, very stringent diet of hardly reading the Bible at all. And maybe some of you guys are like, yep, I'm right there. Or you wouldn't dare to raise your hand because you're like, I don't want to admit that. But that might actually be where you're at. 
And I remember kind of realizing there's this big component that's missing about my faith, but I didn't really know even how to get there. And so what it took for me is that when I got, finally got into university, I have, and so when you guys get to, if you guys go to university one day and you get to go live on campus, they'll, what some universities do is they'll give you this, this person who's called an RA, they're called a resident advisor. Uh, and they're essentially, they're your, uh, like they're your parent, uh, <laughs> kind of when you are at college. And they kind of just check in on you, make sure um, that you're doing okay, and mostly just make sure that you're not being too much of a fool uh, during your freshman year when you're, when you're in college. Um, and God gifted uh, me with an RA that year who was doing, uh, was actually studying the Bible. And at some point, we just, I, we, I began to share my life with him and he said, hey, like, can I, essentially he just said, like, why don't we just start meeting up every week? We'll meet up for breakfast on Thursdays and we'll just, we'll just grab some breakfast together. And I just want to, I want to talk with you about your faith. And, what, and one of the big things that came out of that is he just said, hey, like, let's start reading the Bible together. Why don't we pick a book? And start slowly walking through it together. And so we picked the book of Romans. And I have this, had this small little tiny journal. I remember it had, for some odd reason, like a leaf that had been like imprinted into the journal. And I remember that that was the first place and space that I began to spend time in God's word intentionally on a day-to-day basis. And as I did that, slowly journaling through, just asking a couple of questions about God's word uh, through the book of Romans, it is, it is as if God's word came alive to me for the first time. I, I began to read things and, and, and see things in God's word, and it left me at the end of the book of Romans, like I was like, man, like, I've got to go to the next thing. And so I just kept on going. I went to 1 Corinthians, and then to 2 Corinthians, and then I went to Galatians, and Ephesians, and Philippians, and Colossians. I just slowly worked my way all the way through these letters, and by the end of my freshman year of college, I was like, I... Man, like I, 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 I've, I've, you know, I've heard other people like talking about reading the whole Bible before. Like, what would it mean to do that? And so then, over the next year or two, I began to read the whole Bible, and and what ended up happening as I did this, I began to see, like what, like kind of where everything fit into place when it came to God's word. And I'm sure many of you guys probably are sitting in this room, and you've been sitting in church for a long time potentially, and you've heard all of these stories. You've maybe even been, you, maybe you're actually even very attentive to all the stories that are being told by the different Bible teachers, but you've yet to actually be able to take a step back and kind of take that big, like think of it like the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and you look back and you're like, I remember Iron Man 1 or like The Incredible Hulk in like 2008, and you look back and you see the whole thing from beginning all the way end to like to, to, the, to the last Avengers movie, and like... But then we, we've never actually done that biblically and in the Bible where like we see all these little stories. We see, and a lot of us, we spend most of our time in the New Testament or maybe, and then we know about like, you know, Noah and the animals. And we know that God like created everything at the beginning, but we don't actually see how it all fits together. And I remember when I began to then read the whole Bible, I began to see how all these pieces began to fit together. And it's like it opened up my eyes to finally see. It's like I'd been seeing in, in the kind of like in, in a blurry kind of way. And it's like my vision cleared. I remember when I, when I put my glasses on for the first time, when I finally got my eyes tested, I remember like putting them on. And I was like, what? Like, this is what life is like. Like, you can see stuff over there? Like, I, like that was not normal to me. Like, I could, I could like, actually see to the end of the room. And I was blown away. And in the same way, when I finally began to read the entire Bible from beginning to end and I saw it's like it's like all the pieces fit together and it it changed something in my understanding about who God was when I finally saw the full what was called the full counsel of his word all that he revealed himself to be and what it did and what it led to for me is that as I continue to do that, as I, as I continue to spend time in God's word, going back and knowing the full story of the Bible, it led to an increasing amount of confidence, not in myself, but in who God was and who he had revealed himself to, to, to be in and through his word. And what, what, you'll do, what will happen if you spend time in God's word, reading through all of scripture, which I would encourage you, if that's something you're going to do, do it with a group of people what I saw is that God's character, when it, when it truly says at the end of Hebrews that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, like, you've got to look, like, go and find that out for yourself and go back and read through the Old Testament and you see how God has been 
consistently faithful, consistently merciful and gracious and kind. And you'll, it's funny because you'll go through and you'll, especially you'll read like the Torah, like the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You'll go read them and you'll like be pointing the finger at the Israelites being like, man, you guys are so dumb. And God's like, yeah, you are. Like, like he's pointing, like the finger's pointing back at us because like you see how unfaithful and how grumbling they are, but then you realize, oh shoot, like that's me. And you might say, like, oh, but like, like how, do we, you know, how do we get all this information from genealogies? Like, not everything in Numbers is just genealogies. Like, there's other stuff in there. But as we see all of God's word and all of what he said, we get this fuller picture of who he is and what he has done. And so when I come to this idea, and this is the kind of the big question that we want to ask and answer uh, in our sermon today about whether we can trust the Bible, the most convincing evidence that I can give you to trust the Bible is simply for you to read it for yourself. I, and I am going to go through some really uh, helpful historical information here that might seem a bit heady and intellectual and academic that might make it might kind of like like slide this like make the slope a little bit more slippery to trusting the Bible and God's word. But at the end of the day, the thing that is the most convincing argument for the trustworthiness of the Bible and and the scriptures of God is that. It is the word itself. And you might say, if you're a logical, intellectual thinker, you're like, Henty, that's a, log- that's a circular argument. Yes, it is. Uh, but not all circular arguments are bad, especially if they're true. And what God does in his word is that he proves time and time again that he is who he says he is. And once again, like we looked at last week, when we looked at who God reveals himself to be, do you guys remember what Psalm 103 and Exodus 34 said? It says, the Lord is merciful and gracious. He's slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And we see that time and time and time again over these hundreds and thousands of years and stories of God consistently being who he said he would be. And so I want you guys to open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy so it's going to be way in the back part of your New Testament uh, there. So kind of like this is how much is left in my Bible when I get to Second Timothy. So there's a lot left over. So it's going to be all the way back there past Ephesians, Galatians, Colossians, all that kind of stuff. If you get to Revelation, you've gone too far, go the other way, and you'll find Second Timothy. And what we're going to unpack from this, uh, these, couple, these two verses here is some really some key foundational understanding uh, things to understand about God's word. And like I said last week, as we once again go and we unpack 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, and we, ask, and we answer this question, can we trust the Bible? Like I said last week, I do not want you to be satisfied merely with my perhaps secondhand account of talking about the trustworthiness of God's word. The goal of this series is to get you in the game, to get you to say, okay, Henty, I hear what you're saying, but I want to go find it out for myself. And so I hope that, uh, like I said last week, that you might be unsatisfied or dissatisfied with this. And that you would say, I, I want to personally know who this God is. I want to read about him and spend time with him that I might have a personal relationship with him. Because it's in that place and in that space that God can truly work in your heart and your life. And I pray as well that this sermon might be a catalyst for some of you to say, you know what? I, I, beforehand, I, I was not trusting in God's word. I was not running towards it, but now maybe I'm going to give it a second chance, or maybe you're going to give it a first. You're going to give it a first chance for the first time, that you might develop a trust in it. And so let's read 2 Timothy 3:16 through 17. And then what we're going to do is we're going to kind of like unpack this first phrase here for a couple of minutes, and then we're going to unpack the last couple of phrases in these two verses, um, and then we'll uh, apply it directly to our lives. I think I have it on the screen. There it is. Okay, this is what God's word says for us today. It says, all scripture, not some scriptures, not just the red letters in the Bible, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. That's God's word for us today. And so let's, let's start at the very, very, very beginning. 
do I have like a nice orange tan now on the, <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> you guys are doing a great job, thank you. Um, okay, let's, let's start with, 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 with probably the first and most basic question and just simply ask the question, what is the Bible? I don't want to run into this assuming that we all agree when we say the Bible, that we are all talking about the same thing. And so I want to clarify what we are saying when we say, when, when this verse says all scripture, and when we say the Bible, here is what we're actually talking about. We are talking about the 66 books that are contained, and you might say, okay, I got to go count all of those, the 66 books that are contained in the Bible. Now, the reason why that's important is because other uh, parts, or I guess you could say sects of Christianity, if you could even call it that, have additional books that they throw in there. The most common one that's thrown in there, and this is where it's going to get a little bit academic and heady, is called the Apocrypha. And, there's, and they are writings that were written between the Old and the New Testament that there is another, uh, there's another sect of Christianity that they say, oh, those writings are of Scripture. Um, however, the New Testament church did not recognize them to be so. And so when we're saying the Bible, we're referring to the 66, 66 books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation in here. And this is what God's word is. So it's the Old and the New Testament. This Bible, these 66 books, were written by over 40 different human authors over the course of about 1,500 years. And these different books in the Bible, I'm sure if you spent any time reading them, you know they have a bunch of different genres in them. Do you guys think you guys know what genres are? Okay, I got like four, five hands. Okay, a genre is like a really fancy French way to say category. Okay, that's all it is. It's just a, it's a kind of category of, of book. Um, if you like my French accent, you can uh, pay me later for it. Um, okay, and so there's a bunch of different genres that, that, that are in the Bible. So there are some, like if you read the first couple of books of the Bible, and especially uh, Samuel and Kings and First and Second Chronicles, those are called history. They're accounting what has happened over time. Then there's another genre called narrative, which if you read through uh, the latter part of the book of Genesis and, and many other parts of it, we see that there is, a, there, there is narrative. There's a story that is happening. And we see that really the whole Bible in and of itself is a grand narrative of redemption, of God working out his redemption in all of time and in all of the world. Um, and, that's, and that's another genre for us. There is then poetry. So if you go and read the book of Psalms and other places, you will see that there is actually poetry so poetry is just a really fancy way for essentially saying psalms means songs even the song of songs is a song it's poetry it's it's a kind of writing that's written to meter and melody for the intention of of, of saying it orally but then also being able to auditorily hear it and remember it because it fits so so like i don't know what a popular song is right now but I know that, like, it, when I think of the song, even the last song that we sang, Christ be, you know, Christ be magnified, it's got a really catchy melody to it. And so I'll just find myself walking through the day singing, Christ be magnified. And I'm like, okay, I'm going singing all this stuff. And why is that? It's because someone put God's truth to meter and to melody. And so it's easier to remember in the same way God's word, especially in the Psalms and other places, was intentionally meant for that reason that we would be able to remember it without having to see it. Now, others, there's other categories such as wisdom. So we see Proverbs and, and, and uh, I believe Ecclesiastes as well, that we see these other pieces of literature that are specifically written. They're kind of like these short pithy, which just means like a brief statement of truth and of wisdom that we are to apply to multiple different places in our lives. And then, um, like some of you guys are studying, there are books about prophecy, and, the, and, a, and it's called apocalyptic literature, because, and I don't know why you guys are so interested in that and why people are so interested in that, um, but there's prophecy as well, which, talks, which is much less about telling the future and much more about telling about what God is going to do and how he's going to make all things new uh, at the end of time when Jesus returns again. Then there's laws like we see in Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy just means second law. There is letters like many of you guys like to spend time in uh, in the New Testament. And lastly, then there are the Gospels, which are called spiritual biographies. They are there and they are intended to tell the story about a person. And the person that the Gospels are telling the story about is the Son of God, Jesus and talking and giving an account of his life that we would know Jesus, not just an idea, 
but we would know him in his actual human life, even though he was God and man, that we would know him and know what he was like when he was living and to hear the story that he came to do. So when we talk about the Bible, that's what we're talking about. That is what God's word is. And so these, like I said earlier, these 66 books, they were written by over 40 human authors. And you might say, okay, well, that's interesting because you just said it's God's word, but how can God's word be written by human authors? And this is where we have to get a little, a little, a little, love that word. Uh, it's not a word. Uh, a little academic and a little bit, uh, a little, get through some heady information here. But I think that, and I truly do hope that as you hear some of this, and so I'm kind of giving you some warning, I'm trying to help you guys out here. So this is the part where you put your thinking, your little academic theologian hats on, and you say, okay, we're going to study, we're going to be little scribes right now. And as we go through this, this information will be helpful, because as you move out of high school, and as you maybe move out of Christian school, or homeschool, or whatever it is, or maybe you're in public school, and you've already got people asking you questions about this now, the number one thing that people are going to come back probably to you about is about the reliability of God's word, and whether or not we can truly trust the accumulation that made up this, and whether then and people will question its authority as well as... <clears throat> how it was put together. And so when we say that the 66 books of the Bible were written by over 40 authors, what we're talking about, even though it is written by human hands, it was done what's called, what, what, what is called under the inspiration of God. And so we see part of that here, and even in this passage that we just talked about at the beginning, where it says all scripture is breathed out by God. And you're like, wow, that's super descriptive. Thanks for that. Breathed out? Like, what does that even mean? It's referring to... And the spirit is referred to the wind, the breath of God. And what is happening and what did happen over time is that over the 115, 115, 1500, there we go, 1500 years that God's word was written, God, what God did is that he spoke, he spoke and into the humans that were writing so that God by his spirit supernaturally inspired their words. So they wrote with their own personality, with their own gifting, with their own skill sets. They wrote down the exact words that God intended them to write. The exact words that God intended to be written to truthfully articulate and reveal who he is and what he was doing in the world. If you want to get super nerdy, it's called verbal plenary theory. <laughs> okay, no one's going to remember that, but that's what it's called, where God has spoken through these people who were following him so that, so that they would write these words, and these words would then prove to be true and be a reflection of who God is and what he has done, and that we would then believe them to be true. But as we kind of insert this human element, agreeing and seeing over the course of time that the Bible was written by men, sinful, fallible, imperfect men, under the inspiration of God's word, it fits us to then bring up the truth. another question, which is simply this. Is the Bible reliable? If it was, if we are honest with ourselves and we realize that we are sinful and that the people who wrote the Bible as well were also sinful, that is the Bible reliable? Can we truly trust what it says? Since it was written by human authors uh, under God's inspiration, really we get into the question, does it contain errors in it? Is there things that it's wrong about? Many people might argue that it is, but as a church and as we, I think we see from the Bible, that we see that once again we look back to this phrase, all scripture is breathed out by God. And if something is from God and it's breathed out by him, especially his word, his self-revelation of himself, it is then necessarily logically a reflection of who he is. And once again, look back to what we studied last week and we look back to God being merciful, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He's covenantally faithful. He's holy. He's creator. He's perfect. If that's the God who is breathing out the scripture, then necessarily the scriptures that we find are a reflection of all those things and necessarily they are then also fully and completely true. And what we then also find out is that, that that word that we use to describe that is, is simply that we say that the Bible is inerrant. So you want to say that with me, inerrant. Can anyone say it? Inerrant. There we go. Great. When your parents go, when you go home today, your parents say, what do you learn? You say, we learn about inerrant. And they're going to be like, what? <laughs> and then you get to explain them, explain all this to them. It's called the inerrancy of scripture, which means 
that scripture, because it is breathed out by God, it is a reflection of a perfect and holy and good God, that it, is, it does not contain any errors, that it is infallible. And so when we say that it does not contain any errors, what we're talking about is that in the original documents that the, that the Bible was written in, so in the original Old Testament that was written in Hebrew and some of it in Aramaic in the New Testament, which was written, I believe there's a very, very small part that was written in Sanskrit, another part that was written in Greek, that in those original documents there was no error in them at all, that they all spoke truthfully about who God is and what he has done. But then also, it is infallible, meaning that it is incapable of error. Error, And so sometimes you'll read something. So you'll read Paul in Galatians, where it says it's only by faith that we're saved. And you read James in, in well, James, in the book of James, of course, that's where it would be. And you read James, and he says, and, and then he kind of, he, he, he appears to say something that might sound contradictory to what Paul says about works and how works are important. And we, and we see that because God's word is infallible, because it it cannot contain error or be wrong, it's then our job as human interpreters and to read that and to understand how those two things hold together. And for on that specific issue, what what we see is that yes, salvation does come by faith alone, but the evidence of our faith is works. The evidence of our faith is the fruit so John 15, 8, by this God is glorified that, and we prove to be his disciples that we, that we bear much fruit and so prove to be his disciples. And so let's get a little bit more scholarly here. You're like, oh gosh, we're going to keep on going. And, and I think there's actually some historical evidence here that helps us to understand and to kind of uh, trust in the reality of the Bible, the, reli- the reliability of the Bible. And it comes down, I think, to two things, to two, to two tests that could be really, really helpful. And the first is what is called the document test, okay? Has anyone heard of the document test? Oh, we got one. That was totally a wild card. I didn't know. I got three, actually. There's two over here. Not the only one, so. <laughs> okay, is the document test. So, the new te- so let's just, once again, put on your scholar hat here, and let's just, let's just walk through this real fast. The New Testament has, we have now, so 5,600 original documents of the New Testament original documents in Greek that contain different portions of the New Testament. We have 5,600 original documents that are uh, ranging from multi- like, uh, like about 1,000 years old to, to a couple of hundred years old. And the earliest copy of those documents was written just 30 years after Jesus' life, death, burial, and resurrection just 30 years afterwards, which shows that the people who were writing those documents were literally alive and were eyewitnesses to what happened on the cross and were eyewitnesses to Jesus resurrecting from the dead. And over those 5,600 original Greek documents, what we find is that across all of them, there is a 99.9% accuracy rate in all of those documents, meaning that 99.9% of those documents are all consistent with each other. And you can actually go back and look, but the only errors, that 0.01% of error is of nothing of significance. It's literally like scribes like writing the wrong word down. For example, like sometimes you'll be typing on your phone and you'll say, it's like, it's like when you do like we're here, like W, W, E, like comma, not comma. What is it called? Apost- apostrophe, R, E. Like we are here. <laughs> like, words are hard. Uh, we're, you know, we're. And it's the difference between like literally someone forgot to put the apostrophe and so it says were. Those are the 0.01% of kinds of errors that do not in any way, shape, or form actually change the message or the veracity or the reliability of what God has, has articulated through human authors in and through his word. So that's, that is the New Testament. So, so let me just draw a comparison here of, of another book another ancient book that was written. And this is, this is the closest second to this. And so we'll, we'll, we'll just say here for a couple minutes, so just stay with me. <laughs> keep, the, keep the scholar hats on just, just a little bit longer, and then we'll get to, we'll get to the good part. Uh, this is the part I've been looking forward to. 
So have any of you guys heard of, I don't think any of you guys have read the Iliad. The Iliad, okay. And if you've read it, good on you. That's, uh, that's an impressive book to read. So the Iliad was, I don't remember when it was written, but there are only 643 original documents of the Iliad. And the earliest copy of the Iliad, which is not even a book that is necessarily trying to articulate truth about who God is and who we are as people. It's just a story. It's an odyssey. Its earliest copy, and mind you, this is the closest second to the Bible in terms of ancient text. This is the closest. This is number two on the list. The closest copy was 500 years after the Iliad was allegedly written. Okay, nobody's alive at that point, okay, when, 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 that, when that book is apparently copied. No original people were there when that book was published. And the accuracy rate of that book over, over those 643 copies drops down to 95%. So I, I share that to say, friends, that the reliability of what we have here in our hands in the New Testament it's the highest reliability of an ancient document in the history of all documents. There is, there is there, the, 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 once again, second place, second place, a really sad second place, was written 500 years after. No, no, one, who was no one was alive then at that point who, when that book had originally been written. And so I think even in that, and so if that interests you, I would encourage you to go read some more about that online. There's a ton of information about that kind of stuff, and it's really fascinating, and it's actually really encouraging to read. And the text that we have here in the Bible really faithfully articulates who God is and what he has done. But probably more importantly than all of that really scribal information about God's word comes down to what's called the character test. It comes down to this one sole character who keeps on showing up in the Bible, and his name is Jesus. And what Jesus does time and time again in the New Testament is that he refers back to, one, he says that God's word and what he is saying is true, but then he also goes back and he quotes the Old Testament time and time again uh, in, in brevity, so in short amounts, but then also in its totality as well, saying that all of God's word, especially the Old Testament, is true. And so if you want to write some of those, down, those verses down, I'm going to just say them to you. I didn't put them up on the screen because I forgot. But in Matthew 5.17, Jesus says, he, said, he, he talks about in, right there in the Sermon on the Mount, that he has come not to abolish the law, but rather to fulfill all of the law and the prophets. He's referring to the Old Testament writings that, that, that the Jewish people there had at that time. And he's saying, I didn't come to throw them away. I came to fulfill it. He says a similar, he has a similar thing in Luke 24, 44 through 46, where he's saying, he's talking to some, I, I, I believe, to some religious leaders, and he's saying, guys, all that you've read about in the Old Testament here, this whole second half, he's like, this is all talking about me. It's pointing towards me. Jesus is looking back at the Old Testament and saying, all of this that I have spoken is, in fact, true. And another example of that comes from John 5, verse 39. And so we connect that, that Jesus, the very Son of God, the one who, who died for our sins and raised on the third day, showing his victory over death and over sin, that we might place faith in him and find true life, that this, this God-man, Jesus, is referring back to the Old Testament and speaking of and presently in the New Testament, and he's saying all of it is true. And in that, he speaks not just as some arbitrary figure 2,000 years ago, but he's speaking very much so as God himself. And he's saying that this word that he has given, you go back and you read John 1.1, 1, 1, it says, God, in the beginning was the word. And we see that Jesus there in the very beginning says, I was the word at the beginning. The word that was spoken out, he's saying, That's, that, that was me. And so in that, we see that at this word, this, the truthfulness, the reliability, the trustworthiness, the character, the integrity of God's word is a reflection of who Jesus truly is, but also of who God is as well. And so we see in, in multiple times, once again, 
um, that God's word, it claims itself to be true. So some other passages, if you want to write some of those down, are these. In Psalm 12, verse 6, it says that. Obviously, in this passage that we focused on, in 2 Timothy 3, 16, it says that. In John 10, 35, it says that. And then even in Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, God's word claims itself to be true. And you might say, well, that's, once again, Henty, that's a circular argument. Aren't circular arguments bad? Once again, no, circular arguments aren't bad if they say true things. And, why, and think about it. Why, why else would God's word claim to be anything else than what it is? If it is true, then it should then fittingly say that it is true. <laughs> and God multiple times and in his word does that where he explains that his, and he says that this word is true. And as we go into read the rest of uh, this verse, what we see here is these things, that it is in fact true. And so this gets us to this kind of this last question here. And this is where we're going to kind of like ride this all the way down uh, home here. And we'll get, and we'll, then we'll be done with um, with our time here together today. But as it comes to this question then, is that, okay, if God's word is true, then is, is it sufficient? Is it, which is a really fancy way of saying, is it enough? Does it address all the things in my life? Does it address the modern issues that we are struggling with today? Does God's, is God's word sufficient enough for that? And I would argue not only is it sufficient, but it is authoritative, it is helpful, it is instructive. And as we see in this passage here, it is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God or the woman of God may be complete and equipped for every good work. And so let's just look through very, very briefly how God's word is sufficient just by breaking these things down and drawing your attention to some passages that talk about them. So God's word, it teaches us. So if you go to Psalm 103, once again, like we looked at last week, God's word teaches us, um, amongst other things, it teaches us most importantly about who God is. So if you've got a question about, man, who is God? How do I understand his character and what he's revealed about himself? that I might actually know him and have a relationship with him. And I feel like this is vitally important, especially when it comes to prayer, when it comes to issues of sin, where we're wrestling and we're struggling through these things. If we don't understand who God is, we're not going to get prayer right. If we, if we think that God is some angry, frustrated, just, uh, I can't believe you did it again kind of God, that's not God's revelation of himself. That's our kind of projecting onto him who we think him to be. And so God's word then teaches us who he is, and then he also teaches us how to live. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 13 through 25, talks about how because when we place faith in Jesus for what he has done, that also then means that now because we are with him, we get to then, we, we are given the holiness that he has, and we get to walk in that and grow in that as well. So we see that God's word, it teaches us, but also it reproves us, meaning that it convicts us, it points out to us, and it gives us, um, despite what the world would say, an actual way to understand what is right and what is wrong. That truth, in fact, is not subjective. It's not up to us. Truth has been handed down from God over time consistently that we might know what is right and what is wrong and what is good and what is evil, what is wise and what is foolish. One of the first places we see this is in Exodus 20, where God is revealing his Ten Commandments and he's instructing everyone into who he is and what, and, 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 and what it looks like to follow him. And there's many other places we find these, these various different lists, especially throughout the New Testament, that talk about and point out what is right and what is wrong. And, what, and the reason why we, I'm saying that it, it reproves us, that it convicts us, and I'm attaching these verses to it, is because it points out to us typically where we're in error, where we're in the wrong, and then how we are to change. And this then leads to the second one, that it corrects us. And so in our passage here, it says for, for reproof and for correction. And so this correction, it moves us from intellectual agreement with ideas about, okay, sure, I've read the Ten Commandments, shouldn't kill people. Great, I get it. Awesome, we're, we're good. Like, I understand these things in my head, and what correction does, like if, 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 if you do something stupid at home, 
and your parents say, hey, you did the wrong thing, and you're like, yeah, I know. It's not enough for you to just say, yeah, I know. They're going to be like, okay, what are you going to do about it? Yeah, well, I, I just know. I just know I did something wrong. And your parent is going to be like, <laughs> no, you, what's the next step? Like, what are you going to do to change this behavior? What, do you, like, what, what, what habits do you need to, to, to essentially to change in order to do this differently? And so where correction is supposed to lead to is that it leads from just a ment- like an intellectual, mental understanding of something and it actually moves us to practical application. That proper correction in our heart and life actually leads us to then living the right way. And God's word does this as well. We see it in James 1, verses 22 through 25, where James says, Do not just be hearers of the word, but be doers of the word also. He says, for people who just hear the word, they're like a man who looks in the mirror, and a moment later he walks away and he forgets what he looks like. And often, for many of us, I would say myself included, that happens. I read God's word, and I'm like, sweet, that's great. Of course I agree with that. Why wouldn't I agree with that? And I walk off and go do something stupid and sinful, and I'm like, why did I do that? And that's because God has to work out holiness in our hearts, and he's pointing out, and he's saying, hey, like, you need to connect these truths about who I am and what I've commanded you to do to what it actually looks like to follow Jesus and to practically apply that in our lives. It then moves to saying that God's word, it trains us. So it says here that um, it, it's profitable for teaching, for proof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Psalm 119, verse 105, puts very, very simply that God's word is a lamp unto our feet and it's a light unto our path. That when we have God's word stored up in our hearts, as we navigate through life, God gives us the truth as well as the wisdom to be able to act and to live as people who are carrying his truth and his mercy and his grace and to be able to navigate through the difficult situations in our lives. And lastly, it equips us. It equips us. And so 2 Peter 1, verses 5 through 11 speaks to this, and it speaks to these kind of character traits that we're supposed to add into our lives through following God. And I'm going to try and find it here real fast, because I want to read this, and this is where we're going to end off today. There it is. So 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5-11 through 11 says this, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. For these qualities, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind." having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the kingdom, of he- in the kingdom of the Lord and of our Savior Jesus Christ. And so we see that God's word equips us for what it means to live a godly and an honoring life, as well as a life that is actually filled with joy genuine joy in Christ, that, we've, that when we live out this purpose that God has for us, it actually brings us joy. It's not a kill joy. It actually brings joy into our lives as we begin to uncover and, and discover who God has actually created us to be. And so I pray that you would hear the warning in this passage where it says, these, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful, which means that if we hear all of this, if we hear all of these words, and as much as this is a challenge to you, it's a challenge to me, that as we hear all these words, and if we just say, that's great, I agree with that, and you walk out of this room and nothing changes, it means that we haven't actually got it. We've missed the bus. The call to action here is that we would hear God's word, we would trust in it as reliable and true, And then we would begin to, and what God is inviting you into now is into trusting in God's word, trusting in it, and then applying it to your life, adding these things into your life, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love, and that these things, that's the fruit. By this, God is glorified that we bear much fruit and so prove to be his disciples. And so I pray that as we kind of as we wrap up now, that, that you would 
hopefully see convincingly so, that God's word is trustworthy, trustworthy, that's a fun word, trustworthy and true. It's a revelation and revealing of who God is, as well as it would leave you wanting more and wanting to find out more about God's words that you would be more equipped in your faith. So let me pray for us, and then you guys can head out, make sure you grab some some bagels on the way out. Father, we thank you that you have not left us without understanding about who you are and your character. Father, that you have left us with thousands and thousands of pages and words that reveal who you are and what you are doing and how you are redeeming the world to yourself through your son, Jesus. And so we pray today, Father, that you would spark in our hearts a fresh and a new desire to jump into your word and to read it for ourselves and to apply it to our lives. Father, as we sung earlier, would you be magnified in us that your glory would be known. Father, we pray all these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. All right, thank you guys. You can take your scholar hats off now. You guys are dismissed. And hopefully we'll see you on Wednesday for our uh, pre-summer camp party. See you guys then.